The ESV version of Matthew twenty four fifteen and 16 says, So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. And Michael's question is, does the language indicate that the holy place here is a physical temple or something else? Michael really doesn't care if it's a physical temple or not. He wants to follow the correct logic path no matter where it leads. The point of this question is, if the term holy place is referring to a physical temple, then A, doesn't that contradict the idea that the Most High God doesn't live in a temple anymore, but in us? B, isn't the reinstitution of animal sacrifices an abomination to Christ? Or C, the most important question for Michael, if the holy place is indeed a physical temple, is not really holy because God doesn't live there and is in fact an abomination, does the language indicate that the holy place is only holy because of a past precedent? In other words, they consider it holy at the same time, so Jesus put it in terms that they could understand. It begs the question, is the temple holy or not? All right, there's there's a lot here. Um, again, the notion about there being a contradiction. I, I would say that the verse, you know, if you actually go back to Matthew twenty four fifteen and 16 and look at the verse, it doesn't actually say God was living in the temple. Uh, it basically suggests only that the temple was considered sacred. In other words, for Jews, you know, they, they sort of presume that the presence is there, or at least the presence, you know, the divine presence of the Old Testament is is doing something with the temple. It, it, it It's a sacred thing. And that's kind of normal. A Jew would think that. Jesus is speaking to a Jewish audience. This is the book of Matthew, again, which is very Jewish in, in its flavoring and its context. So Jesus is speaking to a Jewish audience prior to Pentecost. Uh, if the context, again, some some would associate the uh, you know the, the temple as being you know maybe you know holding some sort of idolatrous uh, object uh, in terms of Matthew twenty four. In other words, that, that's a that's a poor way of putting it this way. In, in, if you look at Matthew twenty four and you assume that this is describing an end times event uh, that's connected with Daniel nine and the abomination, uh, some people will will assume that there's going to be an idol uh, put into this into this temple because. Yeah, prior to Jesus' time in the intertestamental period, the Second Temple period, this is what happened uh, with Antiochus Epiphanes uh, when he outlawed things like circumcision and the Sabbath, you know, and he wanted to sacrifice a pig on the altar and put a you know an, an, an idol in the temple. Uh, those who who look at Matthew twenty four and project it out into the far future essentially are looking for uh, some sort of mimicking of this. But again, that the temple during the time of Jesus isn't going to be looked at that way because that's why during the intertestamental period we had all the Maccabean wars? I mean, they were, they were basically started. This rebellion was started by Antiochus's abomination, and the temple was cleansed, and so on and so forth. So, a, a Jew living in Jesus' day isn't going to be looking at the temple, their temple, that way. Again, so when Jesus is actually talking, the immediate context would be the first century. Again, and Jews would have considered that temple sacred, but. That's a little far afield. The verse itself makes no theological claim that the Spirit of God is living there in contradiction to what Paul is going to say after Pentecost. Uh, it, it just it doesn't say that. But a Jew, again, who's not a Christian, and, you know, who, again, this is pre-Pentecost, uh, a, a Jew is sort of going to assume that. And then after Pentecost is when you get this language about the Spirit of God indwelling believers. So I understand that part of the question, but it, it's a little... It feels a little misplaced because it's not specific to the pre-post-Pentecost issue. Uh, the second uh, element, he says, isn't isn't the reinstitution of animal sacrifices an abomination to Christ? Well, yeah, I would say so. It 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 would be, but again, Jesus is talking in the first century when he utters Matthew 24 to Jews. So it it can't, by definition, be a reinstitution of animal sacrifices. Now, the way the question is worded presupposes two things. One, uh, it presupposes that the questioner is reading the passage, again, in the distant future. Uh, and so that would be a reinstitution of sacrifices. So it, it sounds like the questioner presumes the passage ha is situated in the end times, which, of course, doesn't need to be the case because when Jesus says that they're not in the end times. But second, even if it is in the end times, again, not this isn't. This wouldn't be the millennial uh, temple necessarily, but 
you know, even if it's if you have a temple out there in the future, which you know, a lot of Christians would put in the millennium, and some would would just say it's 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 also operating operating in the tribulation before the millennium, without getting into all the end time speculation here. Uh, even if you put it out in the distant future, then it would it would still be Jews who are doing the sacrificing, and they wouldn't look at the sacrificing as reinstituting sacrifices, in the sense that they're trying to denigrate. The, the cross of Christ. They're not thinking about the cross of Christ at all. So if, if you take Jesus and the cross out of the equation, there, there's no harm for the Jew getting to sacrifice again, because that's going to be something central, uh, because they're looking back at Old Testament theology. So Jesus isn't even in the picture. Uh, it, it, you only get this problem when you're a Christian and you attach you know, forgiveness and atonement to the work of Christ on the cross. And, th- and this is sort of a classic problem with, with uh, those who, who want to affirm a, a premillennial system of eschatology, and then they look back at Ezekiel 40 and 48 about a temple, and that naturally begs the question of, well, what, you know, what about Ezekiel's talk about sacrifices? How can we bring back sacrifices? That would be an abomination because the writer of Hebrews says that Jesus' sacrifice was once for all. Uh, and yeah, he, he does, and I would agree with that. I I personally seen I don't take the uh, Ezekiel prophecy in chapters forty and forty eight as being uh, a, a literal thing that we should expect a temple to be rebuilt with sacrifices. And there are all sorts of, of, of problems with it. The most obvious just is this one about you know having to offer sacrifice again. And people are you know I've I've read all the material on this, and and, and the the explanation is usually something like well you know the people just need to. V- they need a visualization. They need an illustration. They need a, a a picture of what Jesus did on the cross. Well, that that's just illogical. Why not just hand them a New Testament? I mean, this is the way you and I learned about the gospel. I didn't I didn't need to see a, a sacrifice performed so that in my head it would go, oh well, that's what that must have been what the, the cross was about. I'm glad I saw that animal sacrifice so I could understand the gospel. You don't need that to understand the gospel at all. Again, just hand somebody a New Testament, unless you, you want to argue that the, there are no New Testaments anymore, that somebody destroys all the Bibles in the tribulation period or something like that, which again, there's no Bible verse for. So the, the, the whole concept of the sacrifices coming back and being a memorial or an illustration or some kind of teaching tool, it just doesn't make any sense. Jews can be saved today. They don't need a sacrifice to understand the claims of the gospel, the claims of the cross. You also don't need sacrifices to come back for worship. Are we are we to assume that all people everywhere worshiping God, uh, you know, believers worshiping God today, that the worship is somehow not genuine or inadequate because we don't have a temple in Jerusalem anymore? Again, it it, it just doesn't make sense on all sorts of levels. So I I, I see that sort of thinking kind of lurking behind the question. Uh, so I would say, yeah, it, it is an abomination, you know, to to do that as a Christian. But if you're a Jew, you're not thinking about that at all uh, when you when you're looking at Matthew 24 or when the Jews were hearing it. And then the the, the third part, I think, uh, I didn't quite you know follow the question. I think there's a little there's there, there's something kind of missing in the question, at least as I recall it. Uh, if the holy place wasn't a physical temple, it's not really holy because God doesn't live there. Well, you know, yeah, I mean, you could. You could sort of say that 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 part I think is understandable, but the Matthew passage again doesn't refer to the temple itself as an abomination. So they they would have they would have been thinking again if you're a Jew in the first century, you're thinking that God has is is either somehow residing in the holy of holies or has some attachment to the temple or or considers the temple a sacred thing and sacred space, and that you would be punished if you you know committed sacrilege against it or something like that. So in the mind of a Jew. It's going to be a holy place, and even the apostles, you know, after after Pentecost, after after the resurrection, after all these you know key uh, events, they're not looking to profane the space either. Again, they they realize it is a a sacred object, even though they're going to you know Paul and others are going to say the spirit of God really you know dwells uh, in us now and. Some of the temple language Jesus uses in the New Testament uh, about the temple of His body. Again, if you look at how that plays out. You know, the, 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 Jesus referring to the temple as his own body. Well, the body of Christ, you know, after Pentecost, you know, is believers, and that is where the temple that, that believers corporately and individually are referred to as the temple by Paul in First Corinthians chapter three and chapter six and other places as well. It sort of makes sense again to have Jesus being the new temple and his his body corporately being the temple and his children individually being the temple as well. This is what the the apostles describe, but that doesn't motivate them to to again profaning the, the temple. They it's very clear they respect it, 
but theologically they're at a different place after Pentecost.